I think we'll begin. I want to. Uh, my name is Scott Miller. I'm the Dean of the College of Humanities here at BYU, and I want to welcome you all on behalf of the BYU Alumni Association and the College of Humanities to our annual Honored Alumni Lecture. Uh, this year we have the pleasure of hearing from Trevor Packer, who received his, mas his BA in English in 1994 and his Master's of Arts in English in 1996. Uh, so, since that was 96 and this building was built, in two, well, we moved into this building in 2006, this is a new experience for him uh, to be in this room. Uh, Trevor Packer is head of the College Board's Advanced Placement, or AP program, a word that may bring both longing and our interest and, and fear in your hearts. Um, he's responsible for the ongoing development and management of 38 AP courses taken by more than 2.8 million students each year. He also leads the organization's Springboard Pre-AP and CLEP programs. Trevor has led the AP program since 2003, working with his team to redesign AP courses and exams to focus on the knowledge and skills most essential for college success. Prior to joining the college board, Trevor worked in academia, research, and writing about Victorian literature and publishing on Willa Cather and abolitionist Sojourner Truth, as well as authoring a manual on pedagogy and composition. He has taught composition and literature at the City University of New York and BYU. Uh, about Trevor the man, I am most happiest, in, quote, in European cities and love them indiscriminately. I spend one weekend each month in a European city visiting friends or seeing various performances and exhibits, which renews me for the fairly intense work I do for the rest of each month. I love to read and attempt, not fully successfully, to read for two hours each day. I've found that filling my mind with content that is, at least on the surface, totally different from what I'm doing at the office, such as novels, biographies, histories, and mysteries, often stimulates new ideas and innovations in my work. He is a true child of the college <laughs> in that regard and many others, and let us now welcome Trevor Packer as our 2019 College of Humanities Honored Alumnus. Can you hear me okay? No. It's obvious. How about that? Yeah. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. So do any of you remember what happened at the National Spelling Bee this year? Any memories? Eight winners. The dictionary ran out of words. <laughs> it was a sort of amazing moment where they spelled everything. And they finally just had to end at like 2 in the morning or something with eight students unbreakable. The next morning, Merriam-Webster sent out this great tweet. I love it so much. <laughs> the day before, I met with the finalists. And I was excited to do that. I'm enough of a geek about words that the chance to talk to all of these kids about the spelling bee the night before the finals was an opportunity I couldn't resist. So I went to Washington, D.C. And I had three impressions from speaking with these finalists that I want to share with you. Impression number one. You're really small. You're so little. Does this look like something out of Jonathan Swift? You know, over the That's my impression number one. Impression number two is uh, I wondered if they would be kind of, because they're doing words all the time every day, if they would be so, if it would be sort of mechanistic to them, uh, formulaic, that they would have lost the passion for language because it's what they do all day every day. And I didn't sense that at all. I didn't know what to do. I thought they would be nervous. It was the night before the finals. I didn't know what to talk about these kids, about with these kids. So I asked each of them to tell me a favorite word, and I tracked them over the course of the night. The word that came up most often from these finalists is their favorite word was not an especially long word, although some of them did pick these polysyllabic monsters as their favorite word. But the most common word of all things was bourgeois. <laughs> so why do you like it as a as a seminary? Why do you love bourgeois? Awesome? They said we just like the way it feels in our mouth when we say it. We like to spell it because it's so not what it seems it should be. So there's a love of language that I really valued. And the third and final observation I had uh, after spending the night geeking out with these spellers is um, they come from really strong families. Over and over again, as I talk to them, they reference their families, their parents, their siblings who spelled with them, who worked with their own, on them on these spelling, on their spellings. Uh, they come from a tremendous privilege, a privilege that I am grateful that they have. Um, I'm grateful that they have that privilege. 
But I want to speak today about, about less privileged people. But before I do that, I should acknowledge my own privilege. While I don't have these students' abilities to spell, in fact, I can remember the words I got out on. I don't know if that's the same with you. I can't, can't remember the words I got right in the spelling because I participated in an elementary school, but I do remember what I missed in fourth grade. I missed immersion, as in baptism by. <laughs> and in fifth grade, I missed judgment, as in the last. <laughs> and the usual words for a devout young member of the Church of the Church of Latter-day Saints to miss. So I missed those words, uh, but came from a, a background of tremendous privilege, nonetheless. So let me just list off some of my privileges and acknowledge them. Uh, I came from a mother who read to me constantly. I don't remember a time in my life when I wasn't being read to, and I'm so grateful for that. My mother's here. Thank you. Um, she's very clever as well, and that's a privilege to have a clever mother most of the time, except on April Fool's Day, where we would show up at school and unpack our sack lunch and bite into an Oreo cookie, and she would have assiduously scraped out the frosting and replaced it with white toothpaste. <laughs> or we'd bite into our peanut butter sandwich, and she would take in a piece of peanut butter, and sla a piece of cardboard, excuse me, and slather it with peanut butter. So clever mother, uh, mostly worked well for us. Uh, a big family, nine children, a lot of rough and tumble brothers. I broke a brother's foot. So there was a lot of calming that she needed to do. I remember us all sobbing, the rough and tumble Packer brothers that she read while the red brothers to us. So I'm grateful for that privilege of having that sort of mother. I'm grateful for having a father who was a teacher by profession, um, who was a born recon tour and remains such to this day. I would go to bed each night with stories being told to me. And I appreciate the art of narrative that he demonstrates and the way that uh, provided sort of solace to his children. Uh, he became famous in our local religious community in our ward uh, because of the prose poems that he crafted for us when we each left to serve as missionaries. Um, uh, Norman McLean would envy them. They're beautiful. So I'm grateful for those privileges. Um, I grew up in a household where there was very little strife, despite the sort of breaking of my brother's, brother's foot. The worst thing that ever happened in our family was one of my uh, siblings or my father. It's disputed. So I swear a word during family home meeting one night. And my younger sister, Salisa, who's here, started crying because she was worried that we'd no longer be a forever family. So that was a bad thing that happened So tremendous privilege that I want to acknowledge. Let's set those privileges aside because I want to talk about students who don't come from privilege, who don't have those sorts of uh, advantages. And as a result, we do not have the ability to exert the agency that others have. I'm very suspicious of this notion of free agency, this notion that everyone somehow has it. Because I think the evidence is that things happen in many children's lives that prevent them from using and acting on the opportunities that others, like myself, have. So I'm going to talk a lot about that today. So let's shift into, into more um, into, into late high school, which is where I do my work. So uh, let's see, show of hands, how many people took an AP class in high school? Yeah, it's not surprising. BYU received more AP students than any, univer any private university in the world. Um, they don't submit as many scores as students submit to Stanford or Harvard. But in terms of sheer number of students, BYU is number one. Students come here, the AP credit allows them to double major, to minor, to complete their degrees in four years. Um, when that is not the norm for most students. So that's about all I'll say about the benefits of AP, but BYU is a, is a big sort of AP uh, student, um, has, has a big AP student population. So I want to tell you about two recent AP and stu students I encountered over the past five years and ways they chose to prepare to earn college credit. So here's the first student. He decided to use two tools. This is an X-Acto knife from an exhibit. He does something very clever. He mapped out his school's ventilation shaft system and climbed in through the ventilation shafts with these two tools, this X-Acto knife and this portable iron. He lowered himself down into the room where the AP exams are stored. They're always stored in a locked closet. And he took his X-Acto knife, slid open, the sh slid open the boxes that the exams are stored in, slid open the shrink wrap very carefully, took the AP exams out, photocopied them, put them back in the shrink wrap, plugged in his portable iron, ironed the shrink wrap shut, climbed his way out, and when you do something that mission impossible as a kid, you can't not tell your buddies, right? <laughs> so you tell your buddies and you develop an answer key for the exam together. 
But these are students, and they never get the answer keys right. <laughs> There's always a few questions they miss. And when students always miss the same questions in a tight proximity, we can spot them like that. Because there is, um, and when we do spot them, we send people like these. That's really what they look like. I have a team of detectives that do wear trench coats, they show up at schools, they ask questions. And the way we identify those schools is that there is a one in, does anyone know this number? We're the cause of humanity, so I will be me too. <laughs> right? Um, the spellers know it though, I'm sure this number. This is not a French ball or a country dance, it is quintillion. One in one quintillion. There's one in one quintillion chance that these students in the school would have all answered the questions in the same way. So it's very easy to spot, and when detectives show up, they, they, they um, confess. So that's one way of preparing for college credit. Let me show you another way. <laughs> another way. Um, these exams are long, and they're all written by college professors. Dozens of BYU professors participate in writing AP exam questions and scoring the AP exams. So they're written by professors because we want, we do not want students to earn college credit unless college faculty are validating that. So um, students never get every point right, or almost never. But sometimes they do. And a few years ago, there were 12 students in the world they got every single point right on an AP exam. They didn't miss one. Even the professors who write the exams miss points on them. Because you get, you get tired as you're answering a, a, you're using a four hour exam, you forget something, it may not be your area of specialty. The exams are designed to identify very different skill levels. And so the, at the top end of the exam, there are very difficult questions. But occasionally a student gets every question right. And so I thought, I should let those students know. I should send them a letter. I've never done that before. We always just send students a sort of summary that tells them, I've got a score of one through five. We kind of boil the scores down to a one to five scale. We never tell students, did you get every point right? So in this case, we decided to do that. And I decided, I'm going to send them a letter. So I sent letters. I didn't know any of these students, who they were. But then I found out from newspaper articles who one of these students was. He was a young man named Cedric. Here's, uh, here's a, a picture of him from a, from a Spanish language newspaper in Los Angeles. He showed up at school, and he was one of 12 students worldwide who didn't miss a single point on the AP exam. His principal nicknamed him one of 12. The principal had the other students line up in the halls of the school as he walked down the hall, and they chanted his name, Cedric, Cedric. Uh, the media was interested in this because Cedric came from a family of immigrants. His mother came from the Philippines and worked two jobs um, to, to provide for her family. His father um, came from El Salvador and was a maintenance worker. Neither, neither of his parents had college degrees, but somehow this young man earned every point right on, on a very difficult exam. So the media were very interested in this, and uh, more and more articles were generated. President Obama found out about this and sent out this tweet. Cedric, way to go on your perfect score. How about you come by the next White House at Science Fair? Am I the only one that misses the time when this was the sort of tweet that I so much? I love it so much. Was, uh, he had the money. He had the money. And he's, every, every student in the school is a low-income student. They all come from, from impoverished families. But someone found out about this. Many people saw this tweet from President Obama. Someone found out about it, reached out to the school, and offered to pay to send Cedric and his, um, and his teacher. There's his, there's his AP teacher to the White House Science Fair. Uh, the articles kept on coming. I, I hadn't seen anything like this for a while. People were very interested in this story. Uh, they went on, they wanted to learn what was happening in this class because not just Cedric, but every single low income student in this class was uh, passing the AP exam. And most of them were getting the top score of five. How's this happening in this urban, impoverished school? They found things like this that the teacher, Mr. Young, treats his students like a sports team that stay after school practicing problem solving for three or four extra hours and then come on weekends. Um, Effort really does make a difference and can overcome all sorts of barriers to our agency and the opportunities in front of us. I find that really inspiring. In the meantime, though, is it all worth it? We need to wonder, is the amount of effort it takes for students to stay after school, to come in on Saturday, to learn in advanced courses, is it worth the effort? And increasingly, our society, increasingly our society wonders, maybe not. Maybe it's not worth the effort to work extra hard in high school to get into college and get a college degree. I don't know if you remember this, but this is, this is very interesting. 
a few years ago, uh, an opinion piece was published by uh, the treasurer of the state of Ohio in the Wall Street Journal that said something remarkable, that welders can earn, that there are many jobs in the state of Ohio that were paying $150,000 for welders. We should have more students become welders and fewer students go to college. That seems powerful. Like, does our society need more welders? I'm grateful for welders. We sit in a building. We're able to sit here without falling in on us because of welders. I, I'm grateful for that. So, so I, um, that's interesting. This kicked off a massive interest in welding across the country. Suddenly, newspaper articles all over the place. It turned out, no, other, other people are claiming there's welders making 150000 This reached a climax with reports that in Texas and Tennessee, welders were making $350,000 a year. Welders are so important. I'm so grateful for them. Hmm, so that's interesting. Then we saw this. People jumped on board. President Trump invited a welder to his first State of the Union address. There's Corey Adams, the Aiden, Ohio welder and first-time homeowner. Uh, the person who was appointed the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, went on a tour of welding classes across the country. She visited her welding classes in Washington, Chicago, New York City, and Fort Worth, Texas. Ivanka Trump, first daughter, tried out welding herself. Lots of interest in welding, lots of advocacy that we should have more students weld and fewer students go to college. Marco Rubio sent out this tweet. Welders make more money than philosophers. We need more welders and less philosophers and maybe more grammarians. So, um, interesting. I don't know if you saw the Atlantic piece last month. This is all a hoax. This is not true. Paul Pepp does an amazing job, if you want to read more about this, summarizing this. And I pulled those image, that, that information from this piece. Um, it's just not what happened. What Paul finds is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the median, the median salary for welders in our country is not $350,000 or $150,000, it's $36,000. And as, as people in the College of Humanities who are close critical readers, we know that median means half of the salaries are below that. That's what median is by definition. The median salary for welders in our country is $36,000, and half of the welders earn less than that. That is barely above the poverty level. How dare we tell students and children that they not go to college because they can earn $350,000 as welders. Other people looked at this as well. Here's the Washington Post analysis. They found that, that things were a little bit well, better for welders. They compared welder salaries and philosopher salaries with welders earning $40,000 right out of, uh, right, at, right into the profession, matched with philosophers at $40,000. The issue is there's no salary growth. There's a very low salary ceiling for welders. You can work to your mid-career and not even keep up with the cost of living. Whereas you see the, 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 the career path for someone with a philosophy degree more than double over the course of a career. Why is there so much energy around telling us that we do not need to educate all students. I think we have no room to say, while well, some of us have privilege and can go to college, others do not need that and they will be fine. Because economists are consistent in continuing to say that the safest and most reliable way to help a student is to ensure that they go to college. Here's the wage gap back in the 1970s. That gap was relatively modest. College graduates earned just 40% more on average than non-grads. Now they earn 84% more. This is higher than it's ever been. That is driven by demand. Basic principles of economics. The, the gap between college degrees and non-college degrees increases as the demand for college graduates increases. The demand for college graduates in our country is at an all-time high not the all-time low that some politicians have chosen to tell us. And I worry about that, because what this often means is that white and Asians, go, white students and Asian students go to college, and students of color do not, because they're told that equal opportunities are available for them. Um, more data on this, we'll move on. You can see the pattern, wider gap than ever before between college graduate salaries and non-college graduates. Here's the moral imperative for us. If we care about helping students escape from poverty, 
This is what is, things are like for them if they do not earn a college degree. The five bars are the five socioeconomic quintiles. Furthest to the left is poverty. If this is what happens to a student if they were born in poverty and they do not earn a college degree. Most of them remain in poverty throughout their lives, the farthest left bar. If a low-income student though, is unable to earn a bachelor's degree, everything changes. They are more likely to end up in any other socioeconomic quintile, including affluence, than to remain in poverty if they earn a college degree. So that is what I'm most interested in. What can I be doing from my limited vantage point to help many more low-income students complete a college degree? Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about that journey today, and then I'll, I'll, that'll take about 15 minutes, and then I'll open this up to Q&A. When I became the head of the AP program in 2003, there was a lot I didn't like about what I saw, and I'm going to tell you about some of those things. First and foremost, I didn't like that only 95,000 high school students who were from households of poverty were taking AP classes. Out of millions of high school students, six million high school students in our country, only 95,000 low-income students were making their way into AP courses. If you look around an AP course, if we were going to a school and going to an AP course, only one in 10 students in that AP course would be poor. But if you go into any other course in American school, five to seven uh, out of every 10 kids would be poor. In the state of Mississippi, 75% of the students uh, are, are impoverished. So I didn't like that about it. Um, so that's what, that's my focus. I'll start by showing the results. Um, 2003, 95,000 poor kids in AP. This past year, 619,000. I'm so happy about that. And I want to tell you about what, it, what, what that involved, how, what it took, and what sort of work many people around the country did to change those numbers. So that now if you walk into an AP class in our country, one in every four students sitting in that class comes from a poor family. The very students I am most concerned about helping prepare for college and afford college. So the first thing is getting funding for schools to offer AP courses. Because the way our American system works is that students who live in wealthy zip codes go to schools that have more tax money. So they have many more resources, and that includes funding to train AP teachers, and buy lab equipment, and buy computers, and buy the college level textbooks. Every AP student has to use the same textbooks that we use here at BYU. In AP biology class, they're using Campbell, just like we use here at BYU, and, and so on. So the first problem that I felt like we had to solve was how can we help poor school districts get funding to train AP teachers, to buy textbooks, to get equipment and supplies. So there's, there's, there are many components to this, and I have great colleagues in our government relations office who set up uh, opportunities for us to make the pitch to Congress. One of the things I most value about my humanities degree is that here in the College of Humanities, we learn how to tell stories. We learn how to shape narratives. There's that famous study of life insurance sales policies that found that the people that were able to sell the most life insurance policies were not the people who presented data. They were not the people who presented data and stories about the value of life insurance, but the salespeople who only told stories. Now, as an analytic person, I found that so depressing, but it is, that is, it has a finding. Stories are powerful, and here in the College of Humanities, we leave this, this college with our degrees with an increased ability to create a narrative that is powerful and has an effect. So I know I had one shot at this. Our, my colleagues set up an opportunity to brief congressional staff and to make a pitch to add into the federal budget a dedicated line item that would pay, that would give low-income schools in all 50 states a funding source to train AP teachers for their students to buy college-level textbooks and so on. So I thought, how do I do this? I've got 10 minutes in front of congressional staff to make the case for adding $35 million to the federal budget for this purpose. I thought, I need a student. I need to find a student who will tell a really powerful story. So I thought, out of 3 million AP students in the country, who do I pick to come tell this story? And I found someone who I thought would be great. I remembered reading about a young woman named Norma Flores from South Texas, from the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, she was the daughter of migrant workers. So she spent the summers and falls with her family in Iowa while her parents worked in the fields there. And what that meant is that when she returned to Texas from Iowa, she didn't get back to school until November 1st. 
two months after school had started in Texas. Now, most schools would say, you're so far behind when you come back to school in November, there's no way you can take an AP class. This is a college level class. There's no way you can do this. But not her school. Her school put in place special after school programs and weekend programs to help every student, including their large population of migrant workers' children, catch up and earn college credit. So I thought I need to find her. I need her to come talk to Congress about what that meant for her school to provide access to AP courses for, for migrant workers' children. So I didn't know how to reach her because this was in September when I, when I had to make this visit to, to, to Washington. So I called her school and her school said, well, we know her, we have her cousin's phone number here in Texas. So I called her cousin and her cousin says, the family doesn't have cell phones, they can't afford them, but every Sunday night they go to a 7-Eleven in Dubuque, Iowa. And if you call them at 7.30, we will, call, we will talk to them at 7, and we'll tell them to wait for you, and you can call that 7-Eleven at 7.30, and you'll be able to reach them that way. So I called them that Sunday at 7.30, and I said, I said Norma, I, uh, I, I need to talk with, with Congress in Washington, D.C. Can I pay for you to get on an airplane and fly from Iowa to Washington to, to tell your story? And she said, I've never been on an airplane before, but if you'll pay for my mother, come with me, I'll come. <laughs> so of course, they came for her mother, came with her. they came, I met them, I met them for the first time in one of these congressional briefing rooms, and they had flown in that morning, and this is September, which as you know, is like uh, um, tempestuous travel weather. <laughs> and uh, they were both a little bit uh, still green sick. And when I, uh, when I saw my son, I said, hey, how was your flight? Was your, that was your first flight, right? You never been on an airplane? And, and Norma said, it was really bad. It just went like this the whole way. And her mother spoke no English, but knew what this meant. She just <laughs> nodded gravely. <laughs> so Norma was amazing. And I cannot prove that her narrative resulted in that $35 million being appropriated. But I can't prove that it didn't. Um, it was more powerful than anything I said. And when a young student speaks with uh, the spirit of conviction in those ways about the value of learning at the advanced level and providing that for many other students like her. Um, it, has, it has power, I think. Um, in a nice sort of postscript to this, I followed up with Norma a few years later, and guess what she, she, she majored in? She went to the University of Texas, a very good school. She entered with, uh, with uh, a full year of college credit and got a degree in aerospace engineering. Of all things, after that, <laughs> you fly across the Western Plains. So, step number one. Step number two. I didn't like the AP exams when I saw them in 2003. I really didn't. They looked pretty awful to me, and it felt like they were creating a situation in which teachers were teaching to the test. And let me show you why. Here is a typical AP history exam question. And what happens when this is a tech question on a high stakes exam? What does that do to instruction in the classroom? I think it does terrible things. Because if this is the sort of thing that can show up on a test, what do you do as a teacher? You just spend all your time, like, I don't know, racing through a textbook and cramming and creating flashcards. And this is what some of my AP classes were like in high school. I remember promptly forgetting this stuff. Here's a science one, the same sort of thing. And when this is what you're doing, like, what does that do to a classroom? And then you forget all that stuff in the summer, right? I mean, I did. I did. I got born on AP Biology, and I, 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 don't, I don't remember any of this. So I, I was really uncomfortable with this. I was uncomfortable as well with the sort of Eurocentric bias of the AP program. At that time, there were AP courses in AP French, and AP German, and AP Spanish, but nothing in AP Chinese, nothing in AP Japanese. I spoke with Dean Miller earlier today. He had been part of a pilot effort in the 90s to try to create an AP Japanese course, but for some reason that didn't go ahead. So I didn't like that either. Uh, um, so what to do about that? I felt inspired by cognitive science principles like this. Let's just each look at this. We'll do a quick sort of hand pull here. Which one of those is real penny? Take your, do your sort of, everyone sort of pick your, pick your poison here, and I'll do a quick, uh, quick poll. Okay, who, uh, who wants to, who wants to be, who was going to be brave enough to venture which thrill penny is? This is not sort of a meta thing. There's nothing semiotic about here. I'm not saying like none of them are real pennies. I just think of it as an image. Like which is the image of the real penny? I. I. 
It's not I. Hey, hey, pretty good. It is A. A is the real pain. Why did none of us know that? Because none of us need to use that information. None of us need that. It's a basic cognitive science principle from Willingham. If you want the sort of good primer on cognitive science, read Willingham. Um, basic principle, like if students don't use their knowledge and apply it to a new situation, they, they don't, it's, they never learn it. We have never learned, most of us, although some of you know it was A, that's weird, but most of, us, most of us would not be able to pick a real penny out of life because we never need to use and apply that knowledge. So I felt like what we needed to do in AP was stuff like this. Here's this famous quote between, this famous exchange between Oprah and Tony. Oprah went for, you know, I love Beloved. Well, I read Beloved twice here at BYU for the first time. I'm so grateful for, to BYU for exposing me to African American literature. I've never read before BYU. Uh, Oprah, you know, I love this book, Beloved, but do people tell you they have to keep going over it? Tony Morrison, that, my dear, probably. <laughs> so I wanted to create space in AP courses for students to look at a few things with great care and reverence, to learn skills from examining those things, and then to apply those skills to new situations. Those are the principles that are required for, for students to really learn. So I reached out to great colleges around the country and said, I want to redesign the AP exams, and I want your faculty to help. I want to redesign the AP exams in world languages, in science and in history to focus on helping students learn a few things as well. And here's what the new AP looked like. With faculty from these great universities, we identified core content that's required for college credit in AP biology. All students need to know the role of synapses and neurons. And then we paired each piece of content with a task for the students to perform. The task here is use a model to explain a scientific phenomenon. And then that creates the newest style AP exam questions that have been on the AP exams for the past few years. A new question is no longer this memorized multiple choice thing, but this sort of task. Create a diagram showing how nervous systems transmit, transmit information. That changes what happens in classrooms entirely. If this is the sort of task on a test for college credit, teachers teach entirely different. Students are then doing fewer things with great intentionality. They are practicing to develop skills that are required for success in your majors. Here's a new style AP history question, as you can see, entirely different. We scrapped all of those multiple choice questions that I showed you and replaced them. Every question on the AP history exam is now source-based. The students are confronted here with two secondary sources and a set of analytic tasks where they have to analyze those sources and summon up evidence. Uh, we want AP history students to be evidence ninjas to get great at refuting, corroborating, um, supporting, rebutting based on evidence that they find in the texts and in the primary and secondary sources of history. Let me do a quick sound check because my voice is getting a little bit forced. Can you hear me okay in the back still? Do I need to speak louder? Okay. Great. Here's a new style AP science question. So the students are given lab data and they have to do things with that lab data. They have to explain what's going on there. They have to predict what happens. They have to justify their prediction. Completely different than the old style AP questions. This changes instruction. As a result, we have now seen in the studies, every year we track how AP students do when they skip into a subsequent college course. We need to measure how well they're performing when they get exempted from the introductory course due to their AP credit. The success of students in the subsequent college biology courses has skyrocketed since this change because this change has enabled teachers to change what they're doing, to focus on a few fundamental things very well that are truly required for college success. We've also changed the AP exams so that rather than just one spot in time at the end of the AP year, in some of the AP courses, students are developing and doing tasks all year long. This is the new AP seminar course. It's been in place for about five years. One of the most, my favorite photographs I've ever received from a school. This is an urban school in Miami. Again, every student low income, all Hispanic Latinx. These students in Miami Dade, as part of the AP exam, they have to present and defend their work to the public. This is not part of an AP course, but here's their AP teacher teaching these young men to iron their shirts, to tie their ties. Not part of the AP, but something that will help them as they learn to engage in college academics. That's issue number two. Issue number three that I felt we needed to address to create this space for many more students of low-income households to take advanced courses is to confront the biases and stereotypes 
that we're preventing them from, from accessing these types of classes. So there's this famous, uh, there's this famous study of stereotypes that I'm going to rehearse here. Um, this is from Listing Vivaldi by Claude Steele. So um, the study that was conducted by Princeton researchers, and what the study found is that if you take golfers, I'm just going to use that as one sort of activity, pick some golfers, and if they were white golfers, and you would have them play a golf game. So they would play so many golf games that you could get a sense of their performance, how well, how, how well all these white men golf. That's their score. Then if you took all these white men and told them some information before they golfed, you expose them to a stereotype about white men, which is that white men do not have natural athletic ability. White men can't jump. So by exposing a bunch of white male golfers to this stereotype before golfing, just, just simply going over some data with them and saying, hey, you know, we're eager for you to participate in this golf tournament. We want to remind you that you're going to have some challenges to face because you're going to be competing with golfers from other ethnic groups. And as a white male, uh, you know, this, this, golf, this golf tournament is going to emphasize um, natural athletic ability. And when that happened, suddenly a statistically significant difference in their golfing occurred. Three strokes is bad. I don't know, humanity is pretty good. Right? Not all bad. But if you're golfing, you don't want more strokes. You want more strokes. So that's what happened. So then they did this. Let's take an African American golfer, and they would golf. It. They, they, you know, the same thing happened. You figure out their their golfing uh, uh, scores, and then you tell them the same thing. Hey, golf measures your natural athletic ability because African American males are not stereotyped as having lesser athletic ability. There was no impact on their scores. So we might not believe this. You know, this is just, just, just some flip that's happened. These studies have been replicated hundreds of times. This is in the psychology textbook used here at BYU. There's no question that this sort of stereotype impact on performance exists. And here's what happened next. They took uh, white male golfers and said, golf measures your sports strategic intelligence. This is now a measure of intelligence, how well you golf. And because white men are not stereotyped as having lesser intelligence, that message had no impact on their golf. But then when they told African American men, golf measures your sports strategic intelligence, look what happened to their scores. So I had to believe something like this was happening in AP. That given the historical underrepresentation of minority students in advanced academics and college in our country, something was happening that was limiting their agency to participate in the sort of programs that would propel them into college success. So I did some studies, did some quick pilots of AP. Here's what we found. At the very start of an AP class, there's virtually no difference between white males and African American females in their level of belief that they have what it takes to do AP. That was the broadest gap between students. Every other racial, ethnic, gender combination fell between 96 and 93 percent. That's not significant. At the start of the year, students see themselves as more or less equal. But something happens by the end of an AP class. White males, some of them lose their confidence, but many more African American females lose their confidence. Is there something about the messages that young women of color are sent about their academic ability all year long that just like those golfers, somehow teaches them that they do not have academic potential when they do. So we decided to try something that has been controversial, quite frankly, and that is to say, let's take a random group of AP students and tell them all, you are locked into the AP exam from the start of the year. You, you can opt out of it, but you have to opt out by November 15. Because in the current mode, students can take AP class all year long, and you make up your mind to take that test just right before test day, when the pressure is very high. And that's when these stereotype threats are shown to most affect performance. So what happens? Here's what happened. Every single student benefited from being wrapped in a culture of caring that told them at the very start of the AP class, you have what it takes to earn college credit. You're going to take this exam. There's a 5% gain in white and Asian students earning passing scores on the AP exam. There's a 12% gain in students of color earning passing scores on the AP exam. Among moderate and high income students, there's a 4% gain in passing scores. And among low income students, a 20% gain in passing scores in a single year of simply signing them up at the start, telling them that they do have academic potential, rather than leaving them to the buffeting of society for nine months. 
among uh, science classes where women have always been underrepresented and remain underrepresented in science majors here on campus. There was a 5% gain in male science and math scores, or students gain scores that appear better, and a 14% gain. In these schools, for the first time ever, they had 50% male and 50% female all taking the test and scoring three or better. Gender equity achieved that, I, that I've never seen in science coursework in our country. Uh, so that felt important too. Um, so let me wrap this up. This is something that's studied here in, in our art. Do we have any art history majors here in the room by chance? One. Awesome. <laughs> So you, 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 might, you might know this work already. This is studied in art history classes here at UOU and around the world. I'm trying to make a decision whether to add this into AP art history. In AP art history, we limit the course to 250 works because we want students to have time to look at the works in depth and study them with great care. I'll be in Milan next weekend looking at these to see, like, do we want to add these in? Because these don't survive. These used to be everywhere. These are oil, um, little oil, uh, they're called ampules, little oil containers that were everywhere in the 400s, 500s, and 600s. Every Christian in early Christianity had their little ampule. And it was the major source we have of early Christian art because they would stamp these. They were very, very cheap, which is why almost none of them survive today. They were stamped with various images from the Christian tradition. They, these, they were made of tin. They were so cheap because early, many early Christians were poor, but they all had their oil vial. They would all have these and carry them with them. Um, they haven't survived by and large again because they are uh, they're fragile. They were made of tin, they were cheap. Only a few hundred survived. One in Washington, D.C., two in Berlin, one in Stuttgart, one in the British Museum in London, and several hundred in Milan because they were put inside an altar as, to keep them safe somehow. And they were just discovered in the, in the 19th century. So these ampules are interesting. We have to sort of ask ourselves, why as art historians, like why this? What does this tell us about this culture? What, is, what does this tell us about Christianity, about art? And we might wonder about that. Why oil? Why this obsession in early Christianity with carrying around your vial of oil? What did that mean to them? So let's talk about that for a minute. <coughs> Interestingly, I think sometimes growing up as a Christian, I certainly sort of thought about Jesus Christ as, like, that that's, Christ is like his surname. Like, it's his last name, like Karl Marx or Jesus Christ or something. I, I thought it was a surname. Or it just, I, I knew it wasn't, but I kind of treated it like a surname. But, but that's not, Christ is not a surname at all. Right? I think to get at what this work means, this work of art means, we need to think about Christ is not a surname. It's not Marx. Um, Christ is a title. And so, let's, so let's think about that. We were, we were not asked to be Jesusites. We were asked to be Christians. And so if we think about Jesus and his titles, Jesus the creator, we were not all called creator, the created. That's not the name we've been asked to carry, the created. Jesus, the, what's another title for Jesus? The Redeemer. We were not all, call, we're not called the redeemed. Jesus, the Savior. We're not called the saved. Jesus, the judge. We're not called the judged. That's probably good. Um, but what is it? Jesus, the Christ, is what it is. And what is that? Jesus, the anointed. We were all called, we're told that we're supposed to be called the anointed. And there's something about that, this sort of prevalence of these oil vials in early Christianity. The early Christians, they did not hear themselves being called Christians because Christian was not the word they would have, they wouldn't have heard that word as Christian. They would have heard that word as anointed, the anointed ones. It's so funny, Christ is the only word in the New Testament that, that remains in Greek, so we really lose that sense. Every other word was translated into English in the King James Bible, but, but Christ remains in Greek, so we really lose that sense. But here, the early Christians would not have had that sense. So we have things like this in Acts eleven twenty six. And the disciples were called the anointed ones first in Antioch. They were called the anointed ones. That's interesting. Um, it was probably mockery, scholars think. They were made fun of, like, oh, you all think you're anointed. Uh, it was a term of mockery in that community. We have the bishop of Antioch then saying, wherefore, we are called Christians on this account because we are anointed with the oil of God. And then we have the Gospel of Philip. Anointing is superior to baptism, for it is from the word anoint, chrism, that we've been called Christians. Certainly not from the word baptism. So why is this important? Well, I think when we think about the role of ourselves as Christians and the role of a Christian university and the role of the College of Humanities in a Christian university, I think it's important for us to wrestle with why we've been asked to bear the name anointed. 
we have been asked in the, in the Book of Mormon, Christ asks us to take upon us, not the name of Jesus, he doesn't say that. He says, I want you to take upon yourselves the name of anointed, the name of Christ. And why that? Well, I think the answer is obvious, because what anointed meant was to make someone a king. The only person anointed before, before this whole period where all these Christians were, were claiming to be anointed themselves was King David. The king was anointed. And here in Christianity, we suddenly have a vision of radical gender equality, where everyone, male and female, is anointed to be a king, where every, uh, where slaves and masters were all anointed. There is this notion when Christ asks us to think of ourselves as Christians and to bear that name, he's asking for us to think of ourselves as being part of a society of radical equality where we see ourselves as having divine kingly potential and where we can see that kingly potential in everyone around us. There is no room for tribes if we bear the name of Christ and see ourselves as anointed ones, as those who have been who have received a promise of kingship and divine potential in the same way that King David received that. So I find that interesting. We see something similar in the Book of Mormon. There's this very interesting passage in Alma where the narrator of the Book of Mormon interrupts his narration to make an oath to the reader. That's weird. What's going on there? This doesn't happen but three times in the entire 500-page text. The narrator interrupts and says, I'm going to tell you something that will be so hard for you to believe that I am going to make an oath to you as the Lord liveth that this really happened. And he's not worried about us believing in resurrection, or a miracle working, or someone being raised from the dead, or someone's sight being restored. None of those things cause him to stop the narrative and say to us, hey, as the Lord liveth, I am making an oath to you as my reader that this is true. Why does he do that? What's the occasion here? He feels the need to tell us as human beings that when that the potential for human change is real, that people who we have assigned to another tribe due to race, class, or gender differences, when we've assigned them to another tribe, it makes it very hard for us as human beings to see their potential to change. And here, the narrator is saying to us, I'm going to tell you this amazing story about this tribe of other people who have the capacity to learn and who have divine potential and who realize that potential. And there is something about us as human beings that this narrator, at least, thought it would be hard for us to believe. Two of these times are right here in this single verse. So again, three oaths in the Book of Mormon, two of them here, one of them later in 385. But it's always about this situation. The narrator pauses to say, I am going to make an oath to you that human change is possible, that we must see each other as having divine potential. And so I close with this, that I, in the College of Humanities, I see you I value all of the colleges here at BYU. I think each provide, in the very definition of a university, unique and lasting value. But while we know from this passage that, that it is in the nature of human beings to, to be skeptical of others' abilities to learn and change and to have divine potential, I believe there's less of that skepticism in the world due to the work that happens in a humanities college where I see the reverence with which you look at languages and literatures and philosophies and works of art as celebrating the human ability to change and to create and to participate in the divine. I don't, I value that. I think the work you do as you surface these cultures and their lasting contributions to humanity creates a sense of hope and a sense of belief, of value, and the sort of radical quality that is incumbent upon us if we carry that name of Christian. The work you do, I also see, and the studies you do, filling us with examples of hope. So I'll close with one of them, this keystone text from the humanities major. I don't think many of you will get through your majors here in the humanities departure without at some point encountering this landmark text from Hannah Arendt, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, here in the College of Humanities, I'm, I'm sure you will at some point. It is one of, of the many texts I think I could pick here to sort of show off the hope that your studies give me, and I think the world, of human potential to erase tribalism and to recognize the divine, the kingly, in the other. 
So there's this famous moment in chapter 10 where, um, where, where Arendt is talking about what happened with Nazi deportations. So again, the context here is Eichmann was, uh, was Hitler's logistics manager. He was responsible for figuring out how do we actually get the Jews out of other countries into Germany so that we can execute them. Germany at this point had, uh, had declared itself clean of Jews, pure of Jews. Germany had destroyed its own Jew German popul or Jewish population. So the next move was, let's get the Jews out of our neighboring countries, countries that we have conquered. So they had to figure out, how do you get people in other countries to let go of their Jewish fellow citizens? So uh, Eichmann organized all that, and then he escaped to Argentina when, um, when the war was brought to a close. Um, he was found in Argentina. He was arrested. He was taken to Jerusalem. He was put on trial. The book is about his trial. Uh, so here's the numbers. Uh, 52,000 Jews were extracted from France and taken to, taken to concentration camps. 25,000 were extracted from Belgium. 113,000 from Holland. Only 477 from Denmark. What? What's going on in Denmark? <laughs> so you remember what, 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 what Aaron shows us, that in France, Belgium, and Holland, the Nazis knew that you couldn't just go in and start kicking Jews. But citizens would rebel because they were friends. By, by, by very proximity, they'd overcome a sense of tribalism, and they would not let their Jews go. So they decided to hit first the illegal immigrants. So the Nazis went into France and said, hey, we, we want to claim your illegal immigrants. Not, Jews that have fled Germany, we want them back. So we're just going to take those. So will you help us document them? So they collaborated with the French government and, and to some extent the Belgian government, and a lot with the Dutch government, as you can see. And they documented these illegal immigrants, uh, Jews who had fled Germany for these neighboring countries. And that was their first move. And then in Holland, uh, uh, in Holland, they moved from, the reason the number is so high in Holland is they moved from uh, illegal immigrants. Then they just started taking, society became used to Jews disappearing. So then they took the, the native born Dutch Jews as well. But in Denmark, everything changed in this sort of landmark example of nonviolent resistance. Because in Denmark, um, uh, the Danish refused. They said, we will not do this. We will not turn over our Jews. The king of Denmark uh, was rumored, this is apocryphal, to have worn the yellow star himself. That's not true. What is true is that he wrote in his journal, if, they, if any of my citizens must wear a yellow star, I will yell, wear the yellow star myself. There will be no segregation in our country. There will be no matter of heights here in Denmark. We will not do that. And he was not happy. As the king, he was not happy about illegal immigration. That was a violation of his country's laws. Um, but, uh, but once they were there, they become his problem. They become his concern. They become opportunities to see kingship, anointed ones, and other human beings. So, so what did they do? He, they refused to document. They, were, they refused to comply. They wouldn't send any Jews to, to, um, to, to Germany. So Hitler got frustrated. Hitler sent out a birthday, uh, a birthday present to the King of Denmark. Do you remember this part? It's awesome. Hitler has a total temper tantrum because he sent a birthday present to the King of Denmark, and the King of Denmark doesn't respond. So there's this big meltdown. Uh, where Hitler's so angry because he didn't get a response to the birthday present. So Hitler sends in the Nazi troops to find the Jews in Denmark and bring them out. Uh, the king and, the, and the, the Danes were aware that this was coming, so they mobilized. Um, and I think a really powerful way. So the king himself said, we need to address this in every level of our society. His name written suddenly was Christian. Um, no better name for a king like this. The king Christian and the Danes, they mobilized. First of all, they shut down their universities. Because as the apostle Paul says, knowledge will fail us, but charity never will. So they shut down their universities and they mobilized the college students to set up uh, means to transport the Jews out of Denmark to neutral Sweden. They mobilized their, the synagogues and the churches throughout Denmark to preach the importance of caring for your fellow human being so they could mobilize the Danish citizens to help. In every other country, in French, Belgium, Belgium, and Holland, you could sometimes get out if you had money. And uh, in Holland, you could pay ten to twenty thousand, the equivalent of ten to twenty thousand U.S. dollars, and you could get yourself smuggled out if you were a Jew. In Denmark, the Danish uh, Christians raised their own money and donated to pay for all the Jews to escape on boats. So, what about these four hundred and seventy-seven that were left? Well, four hundred and seventy-seven didn't make it to the boats. They were old. They were sick. They couldn't make it to those transports. 
So they were rounded up by the Germans and they were taken to Germany. And you might think at that point, the Danes have done all that they could do. But the Danes did not give up their Jews. Even those 477, they would not let go. They sent their Red Cross into Germany and they, they hounded the German government relentlessly with care package after care package after care package, making it impossible to ship those 477 Danish Jews to one of the death camps. Only 48 of those 477 died. All the rest made it back to Denmark. I am grateful for messages of hope like this that tell us, despite the warning of the Book of Mormon, that belief in change and divine potential is very hard, that we have many examples in the humanities of belief in change and divine potential. Thank you for devoting yourself to that sort of narrative. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. We'd like to acknowledge Trevor's family. Would they please stand for our applause? For coming to be here. And for those of you who would like to ask some questions, we have the room for another 15 minutes. So uh, come down to the front and we can have a little Q&A. Thank Yes, absolutely. Fair game. Any questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer. Okay. Nikki, please. My sister in law. Okay, so I feel so inspired from today. And I feel like you have mobilized me. I want to go and do the good things. And I know that I'm not a student here, and a lot of you are, but what would you suggest? Like, okay. how would we help? I have a very concrete suggestion. Um, uh, I, I think we should have no tolerance as Christians for identifying elementary school children as gifted. I see no. To create segregation among elementary school students based on very spurious psychometric evidence. And how do you know if a student is gifted at age five? There's no test that is psychometrically valid for that paper. So what is happening is that that is a product of class and wealth. Students who are identified as gifted at five years old are being identified as gifted because their family has money. So to, to allow that sort of labeling is the exact opposite of what we've been taught to as Christians. As Christians, we have been taught that there should be no manner of rights. There should be no label that we take upon ourselves except the label of anointed. Ourselves anointed and everyone around us anointed with kingly potential. So I think you, you should be involved. You should get yourselves on school boards and on PTAs and disallow the segregation of your children between rich and poor based on the label of gifted. That is pure evil. I see no, I see no justification for it. I do think, I, 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 I guess I would also say, I, I, it makes me sad that whereas in the rest, in, in the nation overall, there's been great progress in enrolling low-income students in AP courses, not in Utah. In Utah, it remains one in 10. In Utah, if you walk into an AP class in the state of Utah, one in 10 students in AP class will be in low income, and the rest of the country is one in four. That's not, in, in a state that believes in the text that I, that I believe in, uh, and in, in, where, where many people, I would say, believe in the text that I believe in, I don't know how you read the Book of Mormon and think that's okay. I, I just don't. I see no room in the Book of Mormon for any sort of, um, for, for that sort of uh, class, class system. And the Book of Mormon is obsessed with issues of race and class. Obsessed. The Book of Mormon is not obsessed with issues of, um, and I guess I think it's also pretty obsessed with issues of migration, right? And yes, it's about migrating tribe after migrating tribe after migrating tribe. And if we really believe this text claim to be written for our time, we better take that stuff darn seriously. That this is, we better pay attention to what it is saying to us about race and class and migration. And be perhaps, I would offer to you, less concerned about issues like um, that I thought were sort of like the so cult. When I was here at BYU, I kind of thought, well, I'm going to vote in one particular way or I'm going to believe in one particular way because I'm anti abortion. But if that were really, I have to believe that the Nephites themselves also had issues with unwanted pregnancies. And if that were the issue for our time, the Book of Mormon would spend a lot more time focusing on that and on issues of unwanted pregnancy. And I don't, and I'm not in any way trying to say that. The, 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 I'm not trying to say anything about that, except that 
if we believe this book is for our times, we should probably pay attention to what it's focused on. And if you think about its publication date to the present, the greatest source, the greatest forms of evil in the world from 1830 to the present have been race conflict. The number of genocides has exponentially increased based on race over these past two centuries. I believe the Book of Mormon is a clear and unequivocal call from God to, to address racial conflict in our, in our, on our planet. So, 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 uh, so get involved in school boards, get involved in PTAs, um, and demand of your school, ask to see your high school's data and insist that 30% of kids in your AP classes should be coming from low income households. 30% of students in Utah. So it's not, Utah is not, Utah does have a higher level of affluence than most states. 30% of kids here, slightly over 34% of kids in the state are low income. So that means 34% of the kids in AP classes should be low income too. It's not that way now. Thanks. Uh, other questions? Yeah, please, what's your name? My name's Isabel. What do you study? My major's Spanish and my minor's teaching ESL. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. What a good thing to do. What a Christ-like thing to do. <laughs> um, I have a question. How do you teach a student to not base their worth on their AP score? And how do you <laughs> encourage them to keep trying when it can be really discouraging? Yeah, and how awful. I mean, a score is a score. No one should have real worth associated with a test score. A test score is one spot in time measurement. has very limited ability to reflect on, on much at all. Um, so yes, you're right. Did you, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you see examples of students basing their esteem on, on test scores? Yes. Yeah. What's that about, do you think? Um, I think oh, AP tests require a lot of effort. Yeah. Um, and when you're a teenager, it seems like everything is a much bigger deal than it really is. Um, but I just, even like I have a sister who hasn't passed a test she's taken twice, or just my sisters-in-law who are taking AP tests and they seem like it's their life. And then I wonder, would a student of color also correlate their identity with their test score? Or I don't know, I get worried. How would you handle that situation? That's, that's such a great question. So I think two things. First of all is I, I worry about I, I worry about two things. I worry about all the kids, particularly from underserved backgrounds, who don't, who aren't invited into that sort of community of academics. So that's my biggest worry is that so many kids aren't invited in. But I have a secondary worry of kids that are invited in feeling pressure to do all sorts of these things, to take five or 10 or 15 AP courses in high school. So I commissioned research to try to understand, is there a way to stop the madness? Like how many is enough to really maximize your readiness for college? And it's very small. One or two a year from grades 10 through 12 maximizes the amount of college readiness you can develop from that sort of high school experience. So part of it is that where I'm, I'm trying to partner with admissions offices around the country to stop the madness and say, look, you, you, this, is, this is one small part of high school. You should, before going to college, where you're going to take five college courses at a time, you should probably take one or two in high school as sort of like college on training or a step function in moving towards what you're going to counter as a freshman in university, when you're also dealing with all sorts of other unfamiliar um, aspects of, of, of life. So, so that's part of it. The other thing that I'm trying to get the word out about is that the best research on AP are random controlled trials, where students are randomly assigned to take AP or not, so that you can really determine if AP causes a positive effect. And what those random controlled trials finds is that it is regardless of the test score, that simple experience of being in that class in that community has a causal effect on desire to major in that subject area and success in the major. So there's something about the community, about being part of a group that is seen as having that divine potential, if you will, that potential to participate in the community of art history majors or Spanish majors that has a causal effect on the student's trajectory. And that's much more important to me to the score. The score, we need, to, we need the score to be accurate. And, we, and I, I, I cut all sorts of slides, I'm glad I did, because I was listening. Uh, and all sorts of slides about the ways we uh, sort of, the ways we manage the behind the scenes of this, the bio, how, we, how we weave any bias out of the questions themselves through psychometric testing. But um, we have to have a pure instrument so that colleges can accurately place their students in the right courses. But that's, that's what people should see it as that. It's the journey, it's the learning, it's the course that has value. So I, I think you're right. Oh, I haven't been effective yet about finding a way to get to embed that message in hearts and minds, but I'm trying.
Thank you. Yeah, please. Um, What's so your name and what are you studying? Oh, my name is Sage, um, and I'm studying public health and Spanish. Oh, cool. How many um, Spanish majors in there? That's so great. Okay, so both of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is, you, you showed a couple of examples of teachers who spend time out of regular school hours, you know, investing in their kids and investing in their students and really trying to help them prepare for their AP test. Um, and in thinking back on my own AP experience, I mean, I took six or seven AP classes and I don't think I was ever offered an opportunity to come in after school or study on the weekends with a teacher there. Um, and we all know how hard that can be with a couple of AP students who really don't know what they're doing um, and can get distracted easily. Um, and so I guess my question is how, how do you think we can motivate both teachers and students to participate more in extra learning opportunities like that? Mm. I know because it's such a noble thing, right? Like don't we wish everyone in society were that so concerned about the underserved that they were able to dedicate their time in those ways. Um, what the stories I've shared are not isolated. I do feel like I see constant, what I love most about my job is the sort of honor of serving AP teachers. Public school teachers are the salt of the earth. Like the, the pay is so low and the work they do to serve students is so noble. So they, I love the chance to serve teachers. I, 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 so, um, but I do not know how to incentivize teachers to spend more time they're paid so little as it is that I feel like it's hard to say. My expectation is that they have programs that you stay after school and do weekend work. That said, tons of them do that. Are there any AP teachers in the room? Anyone? Do you, do you, how would you answer that question? You teach AP English? AP teachers don't have a graduate assistant like like, like the teacher that yeah. you talked about your course at college do. Yeah, we it's do really have, noble work. We do have some money though, however, that we can pay ourselves to do that. I just think I don't know. It's, I, I saw that and thought, oh, I would love to do that, and yet my children need me. Yes. You know what I mean? Like I do what I can, and then I. So something I'm something I'm putting some sort of research funding into right now. Is, and I, we're, all, we're all right to be very skeptical of this as humanities majors, but if we can lift some of the burden of scoring student work off the teachers by auto-scoring it for them with artificial intelligence, then teachers will have more time for that sort of personalized work that you're calling for. But I feel like we need to find some way to lighten the teacher's burden. Is there a way we can give every AP teacher a virtual graduate assistant? We can't, public education certainly isn't going to put the money into giving every teacher the same sort of TA that many faculty teaching introductory courses on campus have. But can we do that virtually? So we have, it, uh, for the past years, the, 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 the accuracy of the artificial intelligence to score student essays is just not there yet. But we need to find, you know, if, if teachers are gonna do more, we have to take something else off their plate because there's a, there's a fixed capacity issue ultimately. These are such good questions. Other questions? Yeah, Frank. Sorry to be crass about that. No, it's going to make sense. <laughs> uh, but other dividends, um, if there's look at much research on that, um, like civic participation, citizenship. Um, and there I'm wanting specifically about if uh, you know people go to college and uh, treat it like um, in strictly instrumental terms as a job training opportunity versus what the liberal arts affords. Ultimately, what I'm asking is, is this liberal arts, um, you know, inoculate our citizens against demagoguery? Mm -hmm. That, that idea. Yeah. Right. And has anyone seen, so I'm interested in that question as well, and I feel like I'm not sharp on the extent to which research has answered that question yet. Does anyone in the room know? Does anyone have access to research about the extent to which a liberal arts education serves as that sort of inoculation? It's something I think we're all wondering about. And it makes us better citizens. So we know some things, so we, there are some indications of, uh, that, you know, there's this crazy, am I on, am I on camera? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll say this. 
as you're talking about one state in particular and their crazy war of education and the, the um, I'll say no more. It's not your <laughs> um, so we know we know there's that we know that the, the liberal arts education does result in a higher critical thinking skills and that some see that as a threat and see critical thinking as a negative and have frankly tried to outlaw that in, in state policy. Um, so we have evidence of that. I believe there's evidence that uh, at least higher voting rates and more engaged citizenry. I'm not sharp on that research. Anyone have anything else on this? Yeah, so, yeah, Julia. A completely separate question. Um, thinking about what, how you talked about the, the Book of Mormon and its message to, in our latter days. And I wonder what you, you've experienced in terms of your perspective and your interpretation of the Book of Mormon, which personally lines up with mine, but with other faithful members of the church who don't see the Book of Mormon in a similar light. Is there a starting place for um, like uh, conversations without contention, a shared space that, from your experience? That's a good question. I guess I don't. Do, do other people not see the performance they stated on race? Uh, you have, have they read it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of don't know how to see that. And now it's more than anything else. It's about race and the need for a savior to help us overcome those, those conflicts in ourselves and those conflicts with others. That we need that grace. We need a savior. But that that social justice alone and efforts that there's that combination is needed. Um, so I don't know. I guess I, 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 that's interesting. Maybe I've maybe this maybe is a part of living in New York City for twenty five years. Not, but I don't feel any conflict there. I've never engaged. I haven't seen anyone. Uh, I've, I've never felt conflict with someone about thinking about the Book of Mormon as a call to um, actively fight against inequity. I mean, I don't know how you see. In other words, second Nephi twenty five twenty three, all are like unto God, black <laughs> and white, male and female. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, I'm sorry to be. I'm sorry. I, nope. Am I, uh, don't be sorry. I just thought you could illuminate something for me, but you can't. So. <laughs> I, I do think. I do think. I think. Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> Anything else before we close? Yes, please. What's your name? Uh, Spartan Soto. I'm the art director of the communications office. Oh, that's great. Um, and what was your major? They outlawed the textbook they had a picture gallery plant in it too. Yeah. And uh, in similar vein, my father in law, who's a teacher in Illinois, Censorship. Was, was um, involved in a program that helped Hispanic kids, usually coming from the ranchos and the really poor kids, um, kind of integrate in like this like after school hours. And they canceled that program too because it helped them get A's. These, these kids from poor, poor, poor backgrounds, once they were taught to integrate in like society and so I'm wondering, um, I guess, sort of the no manner, manner of heights, I feel like can sometimes be a justification for not focusing on your identity valid, your identity mm -hmm. valid, mm -hmm. and how do we approach that, I guess, in sort of a, um, I don't know, like the narrative, how do we incorporate that into the narrative in a way that can encourage people kind of answering this question? How do we help people to see that the validation of, um, you know, a, a color or race, and acknowledging the height, right, in that person, but separating it from uh, being Yeah, so I think the Book of Mormon gives us some good examples of this. I, I, I think the no matter by is referring specifically to when you see someone as, a, as an other, and as and because they're other, you do not see them as having the potential to learn. And that's what that, that version of authentic you know, to learn, or to be to be part of the same community as you. There's that sort of difficulty of believing that really we can be part of the same community, that we can all the tribes can reunite. And Mormon saying, yes, as the Lord loveth, the tribes can reunite. So I don't think I ever see evidence in the Book of Mormon saying that that should erase uh, cultural differences. And I think that's what I value so much about the College of Humanities in a university, is that 
the, the reverence and respect and the surfacing and exposure to a diversity of values and, and artifacts of human creativity, I think does on its own create that space for a celebration and respect for difference and a sense of unity around that difference. We all, well, I did not create the monument of Borobudur and had no part in that. By visiting that and studying that, I can feel closer to and value and celebrate and see that the people who created Borobudur in Java as not another bite, but a part of the shared common humanity. I mean, it's the college of humanities. So I think you, this college does that so beautifully, this notion of all these different departments here celebrating all these different aspects of human divine potential without saying that all has to be merged into one um, artifact itself. We're not saying let's destroy Borobudur or let's destroy St. Peter's or let's destroy um, the Romanist chapel of San Sernan. Let's not destroy anything. Let's study all of it and reverence it. And so I think there is, I, I think the Book of Mormon, uh, when the anti Nephi Lehi is that part in Alma, is there a more beautiful story in the Book of Mormon? I don't know if there is. Um, when, they, when they come together, it never says that they lose their cultural distinction. They still live together as people. They, they're living together in Jershon and there. Um, it doesn't say that integration equal foregoing of cultural sorts of um, contributions to the world. It uh, doesn't say they change their clothing. It doesn't say they change their, their, the sacred the, the plays that they watch. It doesn't say they change their art. But it does say they bury their weapons, that they got rid of a sense of tribalism. A, a, a sort of a divide that can lead to violence. I mean, that's not a very good answer, but for what it's worth, it's a really good question. Should we close? Well, once again, thank you very much.